Good evening. It's great to see so many people coming out tonight. On behalf of Kara Flynn and myself, I want to welcome you tonight. My name is Lori Burrell, and I'm Associate Dean for Special Collections. I'm delighted that you've joined us for this next event in our Graduate Student Speaker Series. This is an event that we partner with the Graduate School of International Studies, and we're grateful for them for their ongoing support. Here in Special Collections, we preserve the stories that document the human experience. Every day, our faculty and staff facilitate the creation of new knowledge and research as they guide our users to collections to foster their research. This is very much a process, and for humanists, it's often a lonely one. And it's in this spirit of demystifying research that we've started this series. This evening, we'll hear from PhD candidate Murray Toten, whose work is titled Political Outcast, Justice Jim Johnson and Massive Resistance in Arkansas. We've already begun planning for next semester series, and I'm excited to share with you that we'll have students from three different disciplines, history, creative writing, and studio art, uh, who will be speaking next semester providing our graduate students with an opportunity to share their research, whether that's a finished product or a work in progress, is a key priority for us here in university libraries. One housekeeping item, we are recording tonight's session, so when we do the Q&A, we'll likely be passing a mic around as well so that others can enjoy the event with us. And in closing, I'd like to thank Kelsey Lippert and her PR team who have developed the branding for our series and help us to promote it, as well as Dina Owens, who coordinates all of our logistics. And with that, I'll invite up Mike. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Marie Totten, as Lori said. I'm a PhD candidate here at the University of Arkansas. I would like to thank Special Collections for hosting me and Lori for inviting me and all of you for being here with me tonight. So now let's talk about Justice Jim and massive resistance in Arkansas. So James Douglas Johnson, better known as Justice Jim or Jim Johnson, was in the periphery of some of Arkansas's most notorious political moments of the 20th century. He led the first organized protest against integration in Arkansas. He pushed Faubus to the right in the 1956 gubernatorial primary, and he was behind the scenes in Little Rock during the Central High Crisis. He ran against Winthrop Rockefeller in 1966, and then Senator J. William Fulbright in 1968. His wife was the first female candidate for governor in Arkansas history in 1968. He campaigned for Ben Laney and the Dixiecrats in 1948, and then for George Wallace in 1968. As a young man, Bill Clinton told Justice Jim that he made him ashamed to be from Arkansas. <laughs> Justice Jim makes appearances in some of Special Collection's most well-known manuscript collections, including the Faubus Papers, the Fulbright Papers, and the Roy Reed Papers. Now having said all that, so far, Justice Jim is still just a minor character in 20th century Arkansas political history. My work, part of which you'll be hearing tonight, seeks to change that. Now in this talk, I will discuss Justice Jim's career in relation to some of the state's most infamous political happenings. I will also discuss massive resistance to integration and the role Johnson played in massive resistance politics. By looking into Jim Johnson's career, we can gain a better understanding of the social networks of massive resistance across the South the fight against integration in Arkansas, and the unique characteristics of Arkansas politics in the mid-20th century. So Jim Johnson was born in 1924 in the southeastern Arkansas town of Crossett, located in Ashley County. He attended law school in Tennessee and opened up his own law practice back in Crossett in 1948. The same year, 1948, Johnson became enamored with the Dixiecrat movement. The Dixiecrats were Southern Democrats who were upset with the actions of the Roosevelt and Truman administration in their tepid fostering of civil rights. Most conspicuously, over the end to the all-white primary in Smith v. Allwright in 1944, the integration of the United States Armed Forces in 1948, Truman's 10-point civil rights plan, and then finally to the formal adoption of a civil rights plank at the Democratic National Convention in 1948. In response to these moves, white Southerners bolted the Democratic Party and organized a new states' rights party, later dubbed the Dixiecrats. The Dixiecrats nominated South Carolina politician Strom Thurmond as their presidential candidate and Mississippi Governor Fielding Wright as their vice presidential candidate in the 1948 election. Johnson helped organize for the new party and campaigned on behalf of the Dixiecrats in Southern Arkansas. While 
campaigning, Johnson came to the attention of Arkansas Governor Ben Laney, and Laney took the young Johnson under his wing. Laney played a key role in organizing and communicating in support of the Dixiecrats. In fact, Laney's support for the Dixiecrats was more than just based racism. He helped to construct an entire political ideology that reached back to the political writings of Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Johnson in support of the Dixiecrat position. This ideology will inform, would inform Johnson's career and will be the subject of a later article on Ben Laney's critical role in fostering the Dixiecrat movement. Now, following the 1948 election, Laney advised Johnson he should run for a seat in the Arkansas Senate. Johnson followed his mentor's advice and was elected as a state senator in 1950. Ben Laney helped to fund part of Johnson's campaign and had high hopes for Johnson's political future in Arkansas. In 1954, after serving in the state house for four years, Johnson decided to run for, the, for state attorney general against incumbent Tom Gentry. This was the same year the United States Supreme Court handed down the controversial Brown versus Board of Education decision that deemed public school segregation unconstitutional. It was in this election that Johnson first worked with propagandist Kurt Copeland. Copeland was a shady, obscure, unpopular figure who was known for his newspaper, The Hot Springs Rubdown. Copeland provided, <laughs> it speaks for itself. <laughs> Copeland provided Johnson with information on his opponent in the Attorney General's race in 54. The information was a speculative rumor concerning the legitimacy of Gentry's children. Now, Copeland also, uh, or often published these slanderous rumors, and then would refuse to retract the stories he printed, and often ended up in significant legal trouble. Now, in 54, Copeland's rumors did not help Johnson win the election, but Johnson would continue working with Copeland throughout the 1950s. During the Attorney General's race, Johnson garnered statewide attention and strengthened his support across the South. However, it does not appear that Johnson ran on an anti-integration anti at this point. This is interesting because it illustrates that Arkansans did not become interested in the issue of integration during the election season of 1954. Orville Faubus, while running for governor in 1954, tried to explain to a crowd how he would handle integration, and his approval ratings immediately declined. After this, Faubus avoided the topic altogether. Even after the Brown decision, and after two public school districts in Arkansas integrated, Arkansans still did not evidence any particular interest in the political issue of integration. Now, Johnson's loss in 54 led him on a new path in his career as he settled on the integration issue as a means to boost his, boost his political prospects. He started developing an amendment uh, on interposition that he wanted to propose as a ballot initiative in the 56 election. Interposition would give Arkansas the right to nullify the will of the Supreme Court at least until official federal legislative action demanded integration. Johnson started building a network and support base for his interposition amendment by visiting politicians throughout the South. He went to see James Kilpatrick in Virginia, Strom Thurmond in South Carolina, and James Eastland in Mississippi, just to name a few of these prominent Southern politicians that Johnson had as a network. These men saw in Johnson an ally in the fight to massively resist integration, and they provided him with political and financial support. Now, interposition is just one form of massive resistance. White Southern politicians tried a host of different methods to stop, or at the very least, slow integration. Throughout the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, these politicians resisted integration by closing schools, diverting state funds from public to private schools, physically blocking black students from integrating, abolishing mandatory attendance laws, just to name a few. And they had the support of the majority of white Southern voters. Now, courts often declared these methods illegal, but massive resistors constantly adapted their tactics. These leaders were also creating an anti-communist tenor to their segregationist argument in the South. The Southern anti-communist tactic was motivated by the desire to emphasize the fear of change that already existed, especially change in racial equality. By connecting efforts to increase racial equity, 
with the communist agenda, Southern segregationists were attempting to enhance their position. Historians call this strategy the Southern Red Scare. Johnson was able to transfer these overarching Southern ideas, anti-communism and pro-segregation, and he was able to apply them to integration in Arkansas. His use of the anti-communist angle, coupled with racial overtones, attracted more support than just a purely racist approach. The Cold War was beginning to heat up in the mid-1950s, and to be labeled a communist, a communist sympathizer, or a communist organization was a serious and offensive charge. The dynamic that existed across the South and in Washington, D.C. due to McCarthyism certainly existed in Arkansas. Johnson would use this to his political advantage. Now, Kilpatrick and Eastland, among others, built on the lessons Johnson has learned from Laney and the Dixiecrats. Johnson was building a southern network of anti-integration supporters that in all respects should have catapulted him to electoral success. Young politicians in Florida, in Alabama, and Georgia were using these tactics in the early 1950s to unseat incumbents who appeared to be too soft on the issue of civil rights. Back in Arkansas, Johnson continued his relationship with Copeland in hopes that it could propel him to victory. Now, Johnson told an interviewer in 1999 that Copeland truly believed that the integration of the schools would lead to miscegenation, the mixing of races. Copeland's motivation for helping Johnson was purely racist. Copeland understood that his candor and occasional libelous remarks in the Hot Springs rubdown precluded any chance for personal political victory. Copeland believed that Johnson could defeat Faubus in the 1956 gubernatorial election and Copeland wanted to help Johnson win. Johnson said in this 1999 interview that he was proud of the fact that Copeland was so purely motivated, although he was not always proud of the way Copeland handled his campaigns. Now, Copeland was interested in the Citizens Council movement and wanted to bring the organization to Arkansas. Johnson's mentors, especially James Eastland of Mississippi, also supported and promoted the idea of an Arkansas chapter of the Citizens Council. Johnson believed this partnership was a brilliant idea and the Citizens Council became Johnson's campaign vehicle. Now the first Citizens Council was formed in 1954 in direct response to the Supreme Court's Brown decision. The first council met in Sunflower County, Mississippi, the home county of United States Senator James Eastland. The men that attended that first meeting felt that they had the most to lose from integration. They were businessmen, politicians, lawyers, judges, and other influential upper and middle class citizens. They were too influential to join paramilitary terrorist organizations such as the Ku Klux Klan. They needed to affiliate with and support an organization that would work at the political and economic level to stop integration. The Citizens Council became that organization in the South. Now, the Citizens Council used economic and political sanctions to stall integration in their states. The organization gained a wide following in the 1950s because many of its leaders fostered the perception that they followed a moderate approach to oppose integration. These leaders claimed that civil rights groups such as the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, were actually communist front organizations that were designed to destroy the Southern way of life. The Citizens Council argued that the NAACP was working in concert with the United States Supreme Court and federal government to erode, quote, traditional American values and to foment racial violence. In the era of the Cold War and the Second Red Scare, the middle class was decidedly anti-communist. And by the mid-1950s, it was also becoming more difficult for the white middle class to justify segregation based solely on racist ideology. The Citizens Council leveraged these sentiments and provided these white Southerners an avenue and a message to justify segregation without devolving into the KKK's coarse racist arguments. Jim Johnson wanted to appeal to a wide audience of white Arkansas voters. The Citizens Council's linkage of the anti-communist message with segregation would provide Johnson a political ticket. Johnson's decision to sponsor the White Citizens Council of Arkansas is not surprising, considering his esteem for Mississippi Senator Eastland and former Governor Laney. Eastland had the connection and know-how to help bring the Citizens Council to Arkansas. 
Laney had the name and profile to help Johnson convince Arkansans to support the organization, and by proxy, Johnson's own political aspirations. Now the first thing that Johnson and Copeland did to promote their newly formed White Citizens Council of Arkansas was to write and publish the first issue of the newsletter Arkansas Faith. Copeland was responsible for the content of the newsletter, and this arrangement suited Johnson. Copeland wrote that the NAACP was a communist front organization whose directions came straight from the Kremlin. He slandered several Arkansas integrationists. He called out Governor Orville Faubus and challenged him to address the issue of integration. He also har harassed members of the press and school board officials interested in integrating their schools. Johnson never publicly censured Copeland, nor did he publicly credit his claims. Instead, Johnson maintained a more respectable persona and wrote letters to members about defending Arkansas from the encroachment of the Communist Party. He left the more intense mudslinging to his partner. Johnson's strategy centered about the promotion of an anti-communist agenda when talking to the public and the orientation of a state's rights agenda with his policy. Meanwhile, Copeland served as the slanderous rabble-rouser. Now, Johnson used Copeland as his mouthpiece. At public events, Copeland's role was to excite the audience before Johnson spoke and ask for support for his interposition amendment. Copeland usually took the stage first, working the crowd into a frenzy by yelling about communist front organizations, such as the NAACP, and the plot to dilute the white race. He argued that there would be no purely white citizens left after the schools were integrated. Copeland would also slander other Arkansas politicians, usually Governor Orville Faubus. And although Johnson claimed he was not always proud of the things Copeland said or the way he used false information to get the crowd whipped into a hysteria, he continued to allow Copeland to engage the crowd in this manner. Throughout most of their 1955 correspondence, Johnson's trusted political advisor and family th friend, Phil Stratton, who was doing research for Johnson in Little Rock, told Johnson how successful Copeland's rallies and articles were in helping Johnson gain support. There were a few times that Stratton asked Johnson to rein in Copeland because he was slandering the wrong politicians or was dangerously close to facing libel charges. One thing that Stratton could not argue with, though, was the effectiveness of Copeland's technique. Copeland was able to successfully recruit members for the White Citizens Council of Arkansas, and the organization grew rapidly in a short period of time. Now, using this strategy with Copeland, Johnson worked on a mass membership drive for the Citizens Council throughout the last three months of 1955. Membership was $3, and the member received a letter from Johnson, a membership card, and an issue of Arkansas Faith. Johnson continuously mailed letters out with information on the Citizens Council and how to join. In these letters, he accused the Supreme Court, progressive Arkansas politicians, and school boards involved in integration of being communists determined to destroy white Southern culture. By this time, the end of 1955, Johnson was already involved in fighting the integration of the Hoxie School District. It was this fight that provided Johnson his credentials as a true segregationist. Now, in 1955, Hoxie was a small farm town in northeastern Arkansas. School in Hoxie was split into sessions in order to allow children to be out to help with the fall harvest. On June 25, 1955, Superintendent K.E. Vance presented his case for integrating the school district to a school board. Vance had three reasons for supporting integration. He said it was, quote, right in the sight of God, it complied with the Supreme Court ruling, and it was cheaper for the school system. See, the school, the school district was paying to bus African-American students to Jonesboro, which was 23 miles from Hoxie. Now, after Vance made his argument, the five members of the school board voted unanimously in favor of integration. The pre-cotton picking session for Hoxie students started on July 11th, 1955. The first day was a success. A young journalist witnessed the transition and captured the peaceful integration process on camera. On July 25th, these pictures showed up in Life magazine in an article entitled, A Morally Right Decision. It told the story of a small town doing what was right and integrating their schools. 
The pictures told the stories of young African American and white children being apprehensive and nervous at the beginning of the day, and then by the end of the day playing together as if they had always known one another. This article was widely distributed and caught the attention of segregationists across the South. By August 3rd, 1955, the attitude in the town of Hoxie changed. After seeing the Life Magazine article, segregationists from all over the state and neighboring states, especially Mississippi, descended on Hoxie. On August 3rd, the school board was given a resolution signed by the taxpayers and residents of the Hoxie School District. In this resolution, the author stated that they were against integration because it would not benefit white or black children. The authors argued, integration would displace thousands of black teachers across the South. Black children could not learn from white teachers because black children had less mental capacity. Their town had gained national attention and embarrassment due to integration. Integration would result in race mixing and the breakdown of Southern culture. And that it, had, it was generally agreed to postpone integration in the South until the effects of it could be further studied. These were standard white citizens council arguments. The authors of this document pledged to withdraw support from Hoxie and to make other arrangements for their children. The document did not sway the school board in its decision to integrate, but it marked the beginning of the massive resistance protest at Hoxie. Herbert Brewer, a farmer from Hoxie, became the spokesman for segregationists in the town and his house became the meeting place for Jim Johnson and the Citizens Council. After the FBI became involved in Hoxie in September of 1955, Brewer was convinced his house was bugged and refused to talk on the telephone or hold any meetings inside his home. When Jim Johnson arrived in Hoxie in September, Herbert Brewer was the first man he met. Brewer's attitude and paranoia fueled Johnson's campaign in Hoxie and throughout Arkansas. It was also in September that the battle in Hoxie began to attract national attention. The Associated, the Associated Press reported in an article on September 13th that the FBI was investigating Hoxie. It was this investigation that had Brewer so paranoid and so infuriated Johnson. The FBI's presence in Hoxie created an uneasy feeling in the small town. Johnson used this feeling to fuel his campaign. He again accused the government of being full of communists and communist supporters and argued that federal involvement would mean the end of Southern culture, not only in Hoxie, but for all of Arkansas. Johnson also used this to gain support for his interposition amendment. Now Johnson made speeches in the small town of Hoxie and in neighboring towns and offered his support to local segregationists. Also in line with the goals of the Citizens Council, Johnson took legal action against the school district, saying that the majority of citizens in Hoxie did not support their decision. In response to continued harassment by segregationists, the school board sued the segregationists, including Johnson. Now Johnson used Hoxie to legitimize his stance, to shore up his support base, and to garner uh, statewide and national attention. He took what was happening at Hoxie and used it to successfully transform segregation into his pet political issue. Thus, his rhetoric, tactics, and his organization essentially brought the Southern Red Scare to Arkansas. Jim Johnson was so successful in making the issue of integration a larger issue across the state that by November of 1955, it was apparent that if Governor Orville Faubus wanted to further his political career, he was going to have to make a public declaration about how he felt on integration. Faubus's loyalty to Arkansas, America, and the Democratic Party were often questioned in Arkansas faith. Faubus was not only being pressured to take a stand against integration, he was also being pressured to prove he was a staunch anti-communist. The two issues were so closely intertwined in the South that if Faubus were to remain unresponsive on the race issue, then it would essentially prove he was a communist supporter. Critics of Faubus, especially Johnson, were also quick to bring out the fact that Faubus was associated with Commonwealth College in Mena, which was a leftist school, and that his father was a self-proclaimed socialist. Faubus's educational background was not uncommon considering he was from a very poor family and the college was an affordable option. But in the 1950s, this could have been a career-ending fact. Now ultimately, 
Hoxie won the right to peacefully integrate in a federal appeals court in St. Louis in 1956. But Johnson had successfully taken the issue of segregation and made it a larger political issue in Arkansas and also made it his very own political issue. Now Johnson used the extensive network he cultivated under Laney, Kilpatrick, and Eastland throughout 1955 and into the early months of 1956, bringing in national figures to speak at his political rallies and to help him raise money. Johnson's reputation as a skilled, albeit young, politician expanded in segregationist circles across the South. Johnson used this network to officially launch his campaign for governor in 1956. At a segregationist rally in Little Rock with 1,400 people in attendance, Ben Laney and Herbert Brewer appeared to draft Johnson to run for governor. Laney whipped the crowd into a pro-Johnson frenzy that culminated in a 20-minute pilgrimage to the venue's orchestra pit to donate to Johnson's campaign. Ultimately, Johnson raised almost $2,500, a thousand more than he needed for the filing fee, and he officially declared his intention to run for governor in the 1956 election. Although Johnson's campaign kicked off with enthusiastic support from segregationists, the Arkansas Gazette called Johnson's campaign a, quote, mishmash of distortions, half-truths, and deliberate lies served up to the voters against a background of string music and pious exhortations on behalf of the bedraggled revenue-producing crusade of the White Citizens Council. It was, the paper said, demagogy with the addition of racial overtones. Now, throughout the campaign, Johnson and Copeland continuously called Faubus out for his failure to take a public stance on integration and his alleged communist connections. Johnson had segregationists from Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama campaign for him across the state. And even though the press didn't take, his, take Johnson's campaign seriously, the Faubus campaign did. Before the primary election, Faubus publicly stated that no schools would be forced to integrate while he was governor. The governor's announcement undermined Johnson's political attacks, and Faubus's decision to become a segregationist secured him the victory in 1956 in a second term as governor. Now, despite Johnson's loss, Arkansans did vote in favor of the interposition amendment he proposed, and it became an amendment to the state constitution. The interposition amendment gave Arkansas the right to nullify federal law when the population deemed it necessary. In 1959, the Arkansas Supreme Court struck down a key section of this law in Garrett versus Faubus, and then voters officially repealed the amendment from the Arkansas Constitution in 1990. Now, Johnson and segregationist forces in the state kept pressure on Faubus after the 56 election. Largely due to this pressure, Faubus decided to sign a series of acts into law that would make it more difficult for organizations like the NAACP to function in Arkansas. These acts also fueled the fear that civil rights groups operated in collaboration with the Communist Party. Given this pressure, Faubus had little choice but to denounce the next school to integrate within the state, and that school was Central High School in Little Rock. Faubus's decision at Central High in 1957 proved that he would fight to stop integration in Arkansas. Now, throughout the entirety of the Central High crisis, Johnson and other segregationists, including the newly formed Little Rock chapter of the Citizens Council, called the Capital Citizens Council, these groups worked to keep the pressure on Faubus, on Little Rock Superintendent Virgil Blossom, on school officials, and on civil rights activists, including Daisy Bates. Segregationists also compared the federal government's involvement in Little Rock to the Soviet Union's suppression of the 1956 Hungarian Revolution, once again equating the federal government's stance on civil rights to communist abuse. Faubus, Faubus's decision in Little Rock proved to be monumental for Arkansas's image, the civil rights movement, and for his own political career. Faubus would go on to be, the, to be Arkansas's longest serving governor, but he would forever be branded a segregationist. campaign defined Jim Johnson's political career, although that was not evident at the time. 
Johnson was elected to a seat on the Arkansas Supreme Court in 1958 and served there until 1966. During his tenure on the state court, he developed the persona of Justice Jim. Justice Jim was a skilled orator, a likable man who campaigned across the state, headlined political rallies across the South, excuse me, and remained a segregationist, although he increasingly preferred to call himself a state's rightist. Now, in 1966, Orville Faubus announced he would not seek an unprecedented seventh term as governor, and Johnson decided to throw his hat into the crowded Democratic primary. Throughout the campaign, the Arkansas Gazette hounded Johnson with his segregationist past. Johnson defended himself by arguing that his time on the state Supreme Court had been, quote, colorblind. But he did not help his case when he refused to shake the hands of or campaign in front of black voters during the primary. During the primary campaign, Johnson also sought the advice and support of many segregationist and anti-communist leaders, including Harding professor James D. Bells. Along with George Benson, the president of Harding, Bells was known nationally as a radical anti-communist who had the ear of powerful politicians, propagandists, and donors. James Bell's papers are also located here in special collections. Now, Johnson won the Democratic primary in 1966, which in any other year would mean that he would win the general election. But 66 was different in Arkansas. Now, with the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, black voters suddenly became more influential in the general election. Although Johnson refused to embrace the New Deal or civil rights, he did make some significant changes to his campaign after his primary victory. The most notable change to his campaign rhetoric came when Johnson sent his young twin sons to an integrated public school in Conway. Johnson and his wife, Virginia, were interviewed by the press about this decision, and Virginia and the boys even posed for pictures. Johnson's statement to the press highlighted two different political tactics. First, he said he would comply with existing integration laws, even if he did not personally agree with them. Second, even though he, he said that even though he could afford to send his sons to a private school, he was choosing to send his boys to a public school. Johnson's image as a regular, law-abiding Arkansan was important in the general election because Justice Jim was running against the infamous Winthrop Rockefeller. Now, Winthrop Rockefeller was not a native Arkansan. He had the reputation as a playboy, and he was extremely wealthy, something the vast majority of Arkansans were not. Rockefeller was the grandson of John D. Rockefeller. He was a Republican who supported business and civil rights. Rockefeller came to Arkansas in the early 1950s, and within a few years, he was working with Orville Faubus to bring industry to the state with a position on the Arkansas Industrial Development Commission. Rockefeller was praised by many Arkansans for helping to spur much-needed industrial growth. But once Faubus aligned himself with massive resistance, Rockefeller uh, separated himself from Faubus' administration. And Rockefeller went to work developing a two-party system in Arkansas. Rockefeller supported and campaigned for Republican nominees in the state and unsuccessfully ran for governor against Faubus in the early 1960s. He also worked with black activists to register voters in the 60s, an endeavor that would prove beneficial to his campaign in 1966. In the 66 election, Rockefeller campaigned specifically to women and black Arkansans. He continuously reminded them of Johnson's extreme divisive rhetoric. Rockefeller went after Johnson's affiliation with the Citizens Council, with Kurt Copeland, and with other prominent segregationists. Now, Johnson played the class card in his ads against Rockefeller, constantly reminding Arkansas voters of Rockefeller's extreme wealth and playboy reputation. In response, Rockefeller supporters bought ads informing voters that Justice Jim was more, off, more well off than he let on. Now, after the votes were counted on Election Day 1966, Justice Jim became the first Arkansas Democrat to lose to a Republican in a gubernatorial election since Reconstruction. The majority of Arkansas voters rejected the conservative segregationist in favor of the business-minded, more progressive, for Arkansas, 
Republican Rockefeller. The state Democratic machinery turned its back on Johnson, and it seemed as if he may fade from public life. But Johnson was not finished yet. In 1968, he returned to the campaign trail, this time challenging J. William Fulbright for his U.S. Senate seat. Johnson's wife, Virginia, joined her husband in the political arena in 68 and, become the, and became the first female to run for governor in Arkansas. That same year, George Wallace, Alabama politician and American Independent Party presidential nominee, appointed Johnson state chairman for his presidential campaign. Wallace referred to Johnson as the face of the Democratic Party in Arkansas. This illustrates the popularity Johnson joined, enjoyed from the larger South, even if it does not reflect the reality of his support from within the state. In the 1968 campaign, Johnson continuously attacked Fulbright on Vietnam, again relying on anti-communist sentiment among voters. Fulbright took a different approach in this campaign. He rarely mentioned Johnson by name, and he publicly considered Johnson's candidacy a joke. Both Johnsons lost their primaries in 1968, and voters re-elected Rockefeller and Fulbright to their respective offices, although Arkansas's presidential electors, electors did go to Wallace. So in 1968, Arkansans elected a moderate Republican in Winthrop Rockefeller for governor, they sent Vietnam critic Senator J. William Fulbright back to the United States Senate, and they voted for the pro-states rights racist George Wallace as president. This election truly highlights why 20th century Arkansas politics have been likened to a circus hitched to a tornado. Arkansas just does not fit into the larger mold of Southern politics. In any other state, Jim Johnson's political connections and rhetoric would have catapulted him to victory. But in Arkansas, it did not. My dissertation, partially using the materials inside of uh, the University of Arkansas Special Collections, will attempt to shed light on why Arkansans rejected Johnson, even while accepting his segregationist policies. Now, throughout the 1970s, 80s, and into the 1990s, Johnson campaigned for and performed paid consulting work for conservative candidates and organizations. He toured the South speaking at events with George Wallace and other massive resistors. He occasionally even headlined these events. Unlike Wallace, Johnson never repented for his racist politics. Johnson's Conway estate was called White Haven. And as late as the early 2000s, Johnson told an interviewer that seeing a white and black couple offended him as badly as seeing a drunk in public. Johnson firmly established himself in regional and national circles of the country's most famous segregationists. Little is written of Johnson's career, especially after his losses in the late 1960s. But Justice Jim is one of the most important political characters in Arkansas history. I truly believe that in order to understand and appreciate Arkansas's heroes, we have to understand the state's villains. Jim Johnson is one of our villains. And although his politics are distasteful and they set the, back, the state back in many regards, the fact that there is not a biography of Justice Jim does Arkansans a disservice. I hope to correct that disservice with my dissertation. And I hope that I've enlightened all of you here tonight with this talk. Thank you. said that, you mentioned that he and Copeland had a publication called Arkansas Faith and that he had a good relationship with administrators at Harding College at the time. What is his relationship to um, like religion? Like, was he a religious person or did he use, I mean, what was his relationship with him? I know that in the 66 campaign, Virginia constantly told the press that she thought her husband was being attacked over religion. But other than that, from the information that I find, um, other than saying he's a white Christian, a white Southern Christian, uh, I haven't found anything that alludes to that religion played a super important role in his politics. Um, as you're continuing to explore uh, Johnson's career, are you also going to look at how, as opportunistic as it was, his 
jump to the Republican Party in the 80s is another sort of early indicator of the conservative drift to the Republican Party? In absolutely, the absolutely, yes. All right, well, thank you all for coming up tonight.